I hope that's I hope that's the cry of your heart tonight. It's a real privilege for me to be here. I don't have any misconceptions about my age. There are too many aches and pains for me to think I'm as young as I used to be. And I sincerely appreciate the Youth Challenge Committee giving me the opportunity to preach to you tonight. Normally, I'm not scared when I preach to people. But tonight, I'm a little scared. And I guess I shouldn't be. But one of the reasons I suppose I am is because I want this youth challenge. I want every youth challenge to be all that God can possibly make it. I remember very well when I was your age, we had something we called Youth Congress. It was held in the dead of winter between Christmas and January 1st that week held in Salem, Ohio, and they always had tons of snow. But kids from all over would brave that snow and come and sleep in people's homes and attics and basements to go to Youth Challenge, or go to Youth Congress. And I remember what a dynamic impact it had on my life. And then things fell apart. I don't have time, you don't have interest for me to go into that. But for a number of years, I kept feeling, Lord, we've got to do something for our young people. We've got to do something. And then Tim Dotson called me one day. I'd been Tim's homiletics teacher. I told him he was called to, free, called to preach before God did. I knew he could preach. I'd assigned it to him. I'd listened to him. I knew he could preach. And he called me and told me what he had in mind and said, would you be interested in supporting something like that? And I said, yes well across the years the Lord's let me be here for every youth challenge except one and we had a family circumstance that kept me away I don't want to tell you tonight that I believe with all of my heart and soul in doing something specifically for young people to touch you at this crossroads in your life and by the grace of God make a difference and so I want to pray just a moment and ask God to help that that will happen tonight. Heavenly Father, I'm not as young as I once was. You know the needs these young people have. And I thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to them tonight. I pray that you will help. I pray that you will give my mind clarity. I'll pray, I pray that you will help them to have understanding hearts. And above all else, I pray that God's will will be done and Satan's plan will be defeated and will give you the praise for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, has just come through the temptation. He was baptized in chapter 2, he was tempted in chapter 3, and then in chapter 4, he comes through that and goes back to his hometown in Nazareth. When he gets back to his hometown, he goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and they ask him to read. And he stands up and reads from Isaiah 61. And when he gets done with that, he says these words from Luke 4:18: The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. In the Gospel of John, chapter 10, Jesus is talking about the good shepherd and the hireling, the one who comes to steal and kill and destroy. And he says, the thief, John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief, that is the devil, cometh not before to steal and to kill and destroy, but I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Those two verses basically sum up everything that Jesus intended to do when he came to this world. 
Tonight our theme is encounter, an encounter with God, and we talk about that from our perspective. We hope you have an encounter with God. We hope you came seeking God. But you know, this whole relationship didn't start with us trying to get to God. This whole relationship began with God coming to man. If you go clear back to the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve sinned. When God came, they ran and hid. But God came looking so he could save and forgive and heal the damage that sin had done. When Jesus came into this world, it wasn't a matter of people longing and praying, oh God, come, oh God, reveal yourself to us. No, they hadn't heard from God in over 400 years. And basically, nobody was looking for him. About the only ones that were, were a couple of older people who hung out at the temple and an older couple who were childless and wanted a child very badly, although they knew they were past that time in life. And a few others. But God came looking for man. And tonight, we hope you've come to Youth Challenge looking for God. We hope you came with a passion. Now you say, well, I came for the fun, I came for the excitement, I came to see the girls, I came to see the guys. Well, in the midst of all of that, I understand that, but in the midst of all of that, I hope that there's something in your heart that says, I want to meet God here. Because you know, I'm convinced God has come to meet you and to meet me. As I look through the Gospels over and over again, I see the stories of Jesus meeting people. Every time you turn a page in the gospel, there's somebody else nearly. And as you look at those stories, you find in them people in real life situations. I know their time was a lot different from us. They didn't have super highways. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have a bunch of other things. But you know, when everything is said and done, people are people. The needs, the hurts, the struggles that people have are the same whatever day it is. That's the reason the Bible is still relevant. And Jesus came up in the midst of real people and real circumstances and real pains and real problems and he stepped up into the middle of those things and when he came, he always, he always brought grace and power and forgiveness and mercy those stories come over and over again and I'd like to look at some of those stories tonight in fact I believe with all of my heart that God has come here tonight to meet with us one of the special human interest stories that I find in scripture is the story of the young couple in in uh, John chapter 2 who were getting married and they invited Jesus to their wedding Marriage was a big time in their life. It's a big time in your life. Whether you take it seriously as you should or not, it's a very, very important time. And that young couple had the wisdom to invite Jesus. Now, the ironic thing is they had no clue that Jesus was able to do anything supernatural because he hadn't done any miracles at all. The Bible specifically says this was the first miracle. And so that young couple invited Jesus to come to their wedding. You know how weddings are. Maybe you don't, but <laughs> I guess a lot of you don't, do you? Except that you've probably been to some of your siblings' weddings or some friends. But oh, I remember when I was a pastor, it was enough to drive you out of your mind because people got all these starry-eyed ideas and all of these special things that they want to do. And I don't think I've ever been to a wedding when everything worked. Sometimes you got the little guy coming down the middle aisle with the flower girl and she's dropping the petals very judiciously as she should and he's running around behind her picking them up and putting them back in the basket. Or maybe it's like the little guy that I saw recently on Facebook that was running down the aisle and all of a sudden his suspenders let loose and his little britches fell. <laughs> Things don't always go right at weddings, do they? And the interesting thing about this is Jesus came to real people who had a real problem at their wedding. They were at the reception and they ran out of the thing they were drinking. You can imagine the panic. You can imagine the embarrassment. I don't know who paid. I said to somebody here a while back, if I lived in New Guinea, I'd be rich. I have four daughters. 
And over there, all the grooms have to pay bride prices. <laughs> I'd have charged high prices, man. I'd be set for life with all those girls. But I happen to live in the United States where the, the bride pays for the wedding. So as a result of that, I'm a poor man. But Jesus came to their wedding. Normal circumstances, ordinary problems, no big deal, nothing special, except that this was a real crisis to these young people. They ran out of the drink that they were serving. They didn't know to ask Jesus. They had no past record of his miracles. But into that situation, Jesus showed up. And when he stepped into that situation... They didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't understand why he said, go fill the water pots with water. But they did what he said and took it to the guy leading the operation there. And when they were done, he said, wow, this is great. This is better than what you served at the beginning. Jesus showed up, and when he showed up, he made a difference. I go a little further in the Gospels, and I read the story there of Jesus preaching. I've got a little stopwatch here, or I've got my phone set on a stopwatch here, so I won't keep you too long tonight. I've been accused a time or two in life, unfairly of course, but I've been accused a time or two in life of preaching too long, and I don't want to do that tonight. I don't intend to do that tonight. But Jesus had been preaching all day for crying out loud, you got it made with me. He'd been preaching all day and the people had been following him. And his disciples come to him as it begins to move into the evening hours. And they're very judiciously saying, "Uh, Lord, you you probably ought to let the people go home. They've been with you all day. And some of them haven't eaten all day. And some of them have come a long ways. And Lord, they're liable to pass out on the way home. And then Jesus says what appears on the surface to be the most naive thing. He says, will you give them something to eat? You can almost see them condescendingly say, Lord, we've checked. And the only thing we can find is one little guy, two little fish, five small loaves, the lunch for a boy, a young man. That's the only thing we can find. Lord, if we had tons of money, we couldn't buy enough to feed all of these people. There are 5,000 men plus women and children. May have been 10,000 people there. But Jesus showed up, and he says, give me what you've got. And they brought the five loaves and two fish, and he opened his eyes and looked to the Father and blessed it and broke it and gave it. And by the time he was done, everybody had eaten. Everybody had all they wanted. And the disciples took up 12 baskets full of leftovers because Jesus showed up. And when he comes, He does special things with little things. Now you may think, well, I'm nobody special. You look up there at the kids, the adults, the young people on the platform, you say, I don't fit in that class. You look around and everybody else seems to have cooler clothes than you. And somebody else got braces since last year and your parents don't have enough money to get you braces. Maybe you grew three inches and your body hasn't figured out how to use that yet. So last year you played basketball this pretty well. This year you're pretty awkward. And you may feel, I don't have anything to offer. I'm nobody special. I want to tell you tonight, God's not looking for special people. He's looking for people who give him what they have. We live in a culture where we're always comparing ourselves to the best of the best. Every young man in the world wants to play basketball like Curry. Yeah, a bunch of the rest of you could say amen to that. Everybody wants to be as beautiful as the most beautiful woman on the silver screen or on the stage. And we're, we, we have all these world-class images, and we match ourselves up and say, I don't fit. 
But I've got good news for you tonight. Jesus always, Jesus always stepped into circumstances in spite of rather than because of. God walks up into your life and he does it to say, give me what you've got. And if you'll give me what you've got, I'll make something out of it. I can start where you are and get you to where you ought to be. Right after Jesus had fed the multitudes in Matthew chapter 14, Jesus said to his disciples, you guys go get in a boat. I want you to go to the other side. I'm going up into the mountain to pray. I'll catch up with you. You go ahead and get in the boat and go to the other side. So they get in the boat and do what he says. It's evening. They've just fed the multitudes. It was getting dark then. And so as they start out on the sea, darkness is coming. And come midnight, they haven't reached the other side. Not only have they not reached the other side, they're in the middle of the sea, the Bible says. And they're toiling and rowing because the wind is contrary and the waves are high and they're not sure they're going to make it. I can almost hear them saying, why in the world did Jesus send us? Why in the world didn't he come with us? But things got worse. They looked out through the blowing and the wind and the mist of the waves of that sea, and they saw something. And they thought they were seeing spirits. Nothing walks on the water. You know that. If you saw something walking on the water, you'd be more than a little nervous, wouldn't you? The Bible says they cried out for fear, their lives were out of control. There wasn't a thing in the world they could do about it. They knew how to navigate. They knew how to operate a ship. They knew what needed to be done with sails and oars and all of the other things. But when everything was said and done, they were in circumstances that were beyond their control. And I know I'm talking to some young young people tonight that the circumstances in your life are way out of control. It may not have anything to do with you. It may be that your mom and dad have gone nuts and they're fighting each other and it's like they don't even care what happened to their kids. Or it may be that your mom's got a different guy in every week and you never know. These jerks are nuts. Or it may be that you're finding yourself at Bible school and they start sending you those bills to tell you how much you owe every month and you're absolutely overwhelmed. I want you to know tonight, Jesus shows up in the midst of the circumstances of your life. Just like he did with the apostles. And when he showed up, the wind ran back up into the hills and the waves laid down. And they were looking in awe at Jesus and saying, what kind of a man is this? Jesus showed up. And when he showed up, he brought grace. One time Jesus and his disciples were going across that Sea of Galilee and Jesus said, let's go over there. And I can almost hear them say, Lord, that's, that's where the Gadarenes are. They aren't Jewish people. They're Gentiles. Well, Lord, I've been over there and they, they raise hogs. We don't even eat those critters and they raise them. Hillsides are covered with them. Jesus said, let's go over there. You know what? There was a man over there. I don't know how it started. I have an idea that he may have started out messing around with the supernatural. I don't believe the devil can take over anybody's will without their permission. I think he was messing around. It was cool to be different. It was great to be edgy, you know. Made him a big man in his little world. You know what? Before too long, it turned on him. And it wasn't him controlling this, it was this controlling him. And by the time he was done, it had driven him out of his home and out of his city and out into the graveyard out there on the side of the hill where the caves were. It had driven him until he was uh, he was stripped of his clothes and absolutely naked. It, it drove him until he had superhuman strength to break chains, but he didn't have the superhuman strength to get free from this awful power. And his life became a terror to him and a terror to everybody else. 
And so as that little boat bumps up on the sandy seashore, I can see him looking down and saying, ha, 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 I'll give you guys a welcome. And out of the cave he comes, stark naked, wild hair, blazing fiery eyes, screaming bloody murder, and he runs down toward the ship. But when he gets there, something happens because that's Jesus that showed up. And all of a sudden he finds himself saying, Oh, we know who you are. You're the son of God. Don't send us back to the pit. Can we go into those pigs over there? Don't send us back. Make a long story short, when Jesus gets done, the man is clothed. He's in his right mind. He's sitting at the feet of Jesus saying, Lord, please, can I go with you? Lord, I want to go with you. And Jesus said, no, you can't go with me. You go back to where you came from and tell those people what great things God has done for you. Jesus stepped up into that man's world. And when he came, he brought power that breaks every fetter of sin. Breaks the back of the devil and his imps and all of their influences in life. And I want to look you in the eye tonight and tell you I'm sick and tired of hearing people glorify the devil. We serve a God who rules this world. We serve a God who can break all of the power of sin and can set you free from every single bit of its bondage. This next door is not set in a beautiful place. It's by a nice pool. But the place stinks. I mean, there are all kind of sick people, hopelessly sick people laying around here. People that can't take baths regularly because they're in such bad shape. People with open running sores. It's a messy place. The reason they're here is because there's this little pool and there's this story that's been around for years that says an angel comes down and troubles the water. And if you're the first one to get your finger or your toe or whatever in that pool of water, you'll go away healed. And so these are the people that have tried everything else and nothing else has worked. And here they are sitting around waiting for the angel to come. You can tell the new ones because they're eagerly waiting. They're going to be the first. If it kills them, they're going to be the first. Over the heads of those people, we see a man sitting back there in the corner, and he's not, he's not even trying. You walk over and look at him, and he's got big calluses on his elbows where he's tried to drag himself. And into that smelly world, comes a man, a man in a simple robe, a man with no possessions as far as this world is concerned. And he walks through that crowd and walks up to that man and says the most ridiculous thing. He says, do you want to be made whole? And the man looks at him and he doesn't even answer. He says, I've been here 38 years. I've tried to get in that pool over and over again. And he starts the story, the saga. I've tried. I was almost there. And that guy or that guy or somebody else beat me. And now he's here because he doesn't have any place else to go. He doesn't have any more hope. He can't work. He begs. He depends on the benevolence of other people. And he's laying over there at the side watching everybody else. He's tried and failed and tried and failed and tried and failed until he's not trying anymore. But Jesus says, if you want to be made whole, get up. I can almost hear him. It's not there in Scripture. My my imagination is running, of course. And I can almost hear him saying, well, Lord, I can't get up. My legs are a mess. What if I could get up? I couldn't stand. It's been 38 years. I, I couldn't even balance myself, I'm sure. But listen, if Jesus tells you to get up, you can get up. If Jesus tells you to walk, you can balance yourself. And so all of a sudden, 
we see that man trying and he succeeds and he not only stands but he bends and rolls up his bed and lays it on his shoulder and walks down the road toward home because Jesus showed up his life was forever changed I don't know how it started but her life was a mess. It always had been a mess. It might have started in a home where somebody that was older than her took advantage of her and then covered their tracks by making it her feel like it was her fault that they did what they did. I don't know what happened. Maybe she was real rebellious and she was going to take her own way and she was going to have that guy or die. And she got it. But then she wished she had died. Because she'd been through five marriages. Five times she'd gotten stars in her eyes. Thought she'd found the right person. And then it turned out it wasn't the right person. And she'd given up on the institution of marriage. Everybody knew it. Everybody knew it. They were Samaritans, but they had some principle about them. And everybody knew what she'd been through. And they also knew that she was just living with the guy she was with now. Basically, she was paying the rent with her body. She was buying her food with her body. And when he got tired of her, he'd kick her out or he'd go someplace else. And then she'd find somebody else. Her life was a mess. She stopped going to the well in the morning. Everybody was there. She got sick and tired of those catty women talking behind their hands and cutting their eyes in her direction. She heard the unkind, mean, catty things they said. She got sick of it. And so she stopped going in the morning and started going in the middle of the day. That's when everyone took a break, took a little nap because the heat of the day was so intense. Here she is walking down the road, carrying her water pot in the heat of the day, shuffling along if you please. But what she doesn't know is down there in that country just to the south, down there where the scribes and Pharisees are, down there where the people look at them, the Samaritans, and call them dogs, down there where the people won't even walk across their land. They cross the Jordan River, go up the other side, and then cross back into Galilee. She doesn't know it, but down there there's a man who says, I've got to go through Samaria. And his disciples say, Lord, Lord, through Samaria? Everybody just crosses the river and goes up on the other side. Jesus said, I'm going through Samaria. She doesn't know. But when she starts to the well that day, Jesus is already there. He conveniently sends his disciples away to get food in a nearby village. And he's sitting there alone on the well. And when she finally looks up from her shuffling walk, and sees a man sitting on the well in the middle of the day, she doesn't know for sure how to respond. Oh, she knows about men. But she doesn't know for sure how to respond. And then when that man looks at her and said, would you give me a drink? She turns catty. She's not sure how to take him. And she, so she says, why are you, a Jew, asking a drink of me a woman of Samaria. But to her amazement, that man looks at her and says, if you knew who was asking you for a drink, you'd ask me. And I'd give you water that would make you so you'd never thirst again. You can almost see her get a smile on her face and say, oh, okay, well give me that water. That would mean I wouldn't have to come here in the middle of the day. I wouldn't have to lug that water pot. If I could just be cured of needing water, give it to me. And he says, okay, go get your husband. And just like that, the door of her life closes. And she begins to back off and say, 
I don't have a husband. And he says, I know. I know you've had five. And the one you're living with now is not your husband. And all of a sudden, her eyes are big. And she said, well, it sounds to me kind of like you're a prophet. And then she tries to change the subject. She said, your fathers say that you're supposed to worship, we're supposed to worship in Jerusalem, but our fathers say we're supposed to worship in this mountain. But then she becomes religious and she says, but when Messiah comes, he'll tell us. And Jesus looks at her and says, I'm him. I came to this well today on purpose. I came looking for you. We don't get all the details, but I know this much. By the time he was done, she had left her water pot and gone back to the village and said, come, to, come see somebody who told me everything I ever did. He didn't tell her everything. He just told her the worst things. Come see this man. And by the time they were done, the gospel of Jesus Christ had changed many lives in Samaria. Because when Jesus shows up, he always makes a difference. You say, well, Brother Stetler, those are great stories. You know, what do they have to do with us? We're 21st century kids. We're 21st century young people, young adults, whatever you want to be called. What do they have to do with it, with us? Well, I think they have a lot to do with you. First of all, I hope you take home with you tonight that Jesus cares about everything in your life. My mother was a simple woman in many respects. Very intelligent, very capable, but she was a simple, believing woman. And she prayed about everything. You see, she was a heathen. She didn't know anything about God. She was, she was 10, 12 years old before she ever heard her first gospel message. The only way she'd ever heard the name of Jesus was in cursing. But one day somebody walked back the long lane and invited the Lamb family to a little Brush Arbor camp meeting. That's where they put up poles and put branches on top to keep people out of the sun and have church inside. They sat on rough cut boards and listen to a man preach and he told the story of Jesus and my mother as a young girl went to that altar first time she ever heard nobody came and prayed with her I don't know if it was because they were so poor they were very very poor I don't know if it was because she was young nobody came you know what there was a man who came and several people gathered around him and a lady began to tell that man what to do to get saved. And my mother listened and did what that lady told that man to do. And I don't know whether that man got saved, but I know she did. Her life was changed forever. She was nobody special. She was nobody spectacular. But Jesus came looking for a poor little ignorant 12-year-old girl. And he said, if you'll give me your life. If you'll give me what you have, I'll make a difference in you. And you know what? I'm talking to some young people tonight. Right here, somebody, some bus captain, some pastor, some youth, youth pastor, youth worker. They've tracked around in your life and invited you to church. And they've brought you to Youth Challenge. And you're looking around saying, man, I never saw so many people. They're close to my age. I want to tell you something. Jesus has showed up in your life tonight. He showed up at your heart's door tonight. And he said, if you'll give me what you got, I'll start making you. My mother asked her dad if she could go to school. And he said, no, women don't need an education. And she wanted to go to God's Bible school. And that was north of the Mason-Dixon line, only by a few miles, but it was north. And he was still fighting the Civil War. And he said, no kid of mine is going north of the Mason-Dixon line. You know, before it was all over, God let my mother go. 
And those good people were good enough to let her work her way through. And God led her to a boy from northwestern Indiana. And they had six children. And all of those children are serving the Lord tonight. And all four of us boys are preachers. And my sister Frances teaches at Penn, Penn View. And my youngest sister, Trelinda, lives there. I can't help but think, God came looking. God came looking. He showed up. And when he did, everything changed. Everything changed. I live in a different world than I would ever have lived in if God hadn't showed up to my mother. Some of you tonight are, are just like those disciples. You're, you're, you're doing your best. You're giving it all you've got. But your life's a mess. There are circumstances in your life that you have no control over. Sometimes you look at others and long to have a stable home. Long to have opportunities. Long to have somebody love you and care about you and say so. You hear people saying, I love you when they hang up the phone. And you think, my dad or mom has never said they love me. Well, I've got news for you. God's got his eye on you. And you know what? I, I don't think I'm just being sensational tonight. When I say God put his thumb in my back and said to me, Dan Stetler, you go tell them. I see where they are. I'm walking up into their life tonight. I'm knocking on their heart's door. And if they'll let me, I'll come into their ship and bring peace in the midst of the storm. Oh, I can't tell you that everything will be perfect, but I can tell you that in the darkest of your nights, he'll be there. In the rough, roughest of your struggles, he'll be there. If you let him, he'll stand by you. He'll walk with you. He'll make you what you ought to be by his, by his grace and power because Jesus has a way of showing up. There's some of you tonight they're like that man in that smelly place down by that little pool. You've tried and tried and tried and tried and tried and tried and tried. Maybe you've tried enough that when you go to pray, they don't come pray with you. They've set all their standard lines. They don't know anything else to say. I remember being at that place. But I want to say something to you tonight. <laughs> when you're laying over in the corner watching others and thinking, I've tried and failed and tried and failed until there's no need to try anymore. I want you to know Jesus comes looking for you. He comes looking for you and he says, do you want to be whole? Do you want to be whole? If you do, you get up. You start standing up. You start trying. And I'll do for you what you can't do if you give me a chance. Do you want to be made whole? Jesus walks up in your life and he says, take up your bed and walk. Go on down the road home. Tell people what great things God has done for you. Don't give up. You know when there's a battle going on, there's something of worth at stake. People don't fight over nothing. And if the devil's fighting over you in your spiritual life, that may be just a real good indication that God's got something special for you. And the devil doesn't want to see it happen. The devil wants to sit on your shoulder and say, you're a chronic failure. You've told God you'll never do that again so many times that he doesn't even believe you. I remember praying and saying, Lord, I don't even believe myself. And I'm glad to tell you tonight, God never gave up. <laughs> Nate Becker, God never gave up. He never gave up on you. There's only one reason why I'm standing here talking to you tonight. That's because God goes looking for the people laying against the back wall that have given up because of all the times they failed. Get up! Give God a chance! Tell God you're going to keep seeking Him if it's the last thing you do. You know what? He'll come to where you are. He'll show up. He'll help you take up your bed and go home and tell people what great things God has done for you.
There's some of you here tonight. Sin's got a pretty good hold on you. And the sad news is, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Unless you do something about it. I wish I could tell you, you'll grow out of that, but you won't. I wish I could tell you, oh, that's just the stage. You're going to move on through it, but you won't. No, because sin is a systemic problem. It's a part of your basic nature, part of your personality. And once it starts moving in your life, there's only one thing that can break the power of canceled sin and set the prisoner free, and that's the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, we live in a world where they talk a lot about decisions for Christ. And they talk a lot about rededicating. And they talk a lot about a lot of things. I'm tired of those things. I want to say to you tonight, what we believe in is transformational conversion. God wants to step into your life and make you a new creature in Christ Jesus. God wants to step into your life and turn on the light in the dark world you live in. God wants to take you from where you are and make you what you ought to be. So many times... Our songs are, oh, I'm glad God's still there. Every time I fail, he, he's still there. That's great. He is. But I want to tell you somewhere along the line, God wants to help you get your feet under you. God wants to help you settle some issues. God wants to help you to surrender to him. Just like, uh, just like our speaker this morning was saying, there comes a place where you need to make up your mind. I'm done with that. I'm out of that business. I'm not going back there. I'll go around the other way to stay away from temptation. God can help you to get your sight set on heaven until you intend to go there. I don't know how it started. I don't know what the devil did. (laughs) But I know this much. I know what Jesus does. And this afternoon I was over there standing in that room, walking in that room, practicing. (laughs) I don't know who lives. Well, my daughter and her husband live on one side of me. And I don't know, maybe Kent and his wife live on the other side. And I'm sure they were laughing at me sometimes this afternoon if they were in there. Because I was practicing. But you know, I got so blessed practicing. I got so blessed practicing. I got so blessed thinking about the fact that I can stand up here at this age in my life, this stage in my life, and look you in the eye and say, I know what God can do. I know what changes he can make. I know how he can transform you. You don't have to lay around in the gutter of defeat and despair and give up because of repeated failure. God wants you to step out of the crowd and become a light to say, go back to your own place. Go back to your own, your own village, if you please, and tell people what great things God has done for you. Can you think of one time in Scripture when Jesus ever hesitated in the face of the devil? Is there one time where he said, man, this is bad. I don't know if we're going to be able to handle this. <laughs> Friend, there never was a time like that. Devils were cowering and pleading and acknowledging that he was the son of God. He controls this world. And if you let him, he'll control in your life. He'll break every chain that sin has ever forged on your soul. He'll set you free. He'll keep you free. We believe in an overcoming gospel. God can do more than help us limp our way to heaven. God can give us something in our life that is new and fresh and real. God can keep us by his grace. Sure, you got to learn to walk. Sure, you're going to do some stumbling around. Who here hasn't? I'm no goody two-shoes. Heard people say they got saved when they were four years old and never broke with God. Good gracious. I lost track of how many times I broke with God. But I want to tell you, God never gave up on me. He kept his, he kept his hounds of heaven, if you please, on my trail. And I want to tell you tonight, he'll do the same thing for you. <laughs> In fact, I feel like my mission tonight was to come to church come to youth challenge Friday night service and say, Jesus showed up this evening. Jesus walked in that door. No, you can't find his seat. But I want you to know he walks up into your life and he slips up beside you and says, I'm talking to you tonight. I want to make a difference in your life. I want to do for you what you can't do for yourself. 
Because you see, you can be transformed by God's grace. I'm here to tell you, God's right where he always was. He's on the throne. His power is not limited. He said, my arm is not shortened. My ear is not heavy. I'm able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you could ask or think. Tonight, God wants to make this be somebody's time when they get up and take up their bed and walk back home to become a part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Go back to that youth group and say, I want to testify to you what God's done for me. And I want to go on record and say, my mind's made up and my heart is fixed. And I'm going to follow God and I'm going to be what I ought to be. And you know what? If you stick your neck out for him, he'll prop you up on your leaning side. He'll give you what you need to be what you ought to be. I want you to stand with me tonight. We're doing a lot of fun things, but you know tonight... The Youth Challenge Committee told me we want this to be a sermon. We want this to be a service that will help people come face to face with Jesus. I want you to bow your heads. Heavenly Father, you know right here in this building tonight, there are a whole bunch of young people that need to just step out of where they are and come to this altar and say, Lord, I'm a candidate. You've come tonight. You've talked to my heart. You've tugged on my soul. Lord, I'm coming to you. Your promise is if you will draw near to me, I will draw near to you. And tonight, Lord, we want to come. I pray that you'd help our young people to do that. I wonder this evening, there's several that have come. I wonder who else tonight will step out of where you are and say, tonight I'm coming to say, Lord, if you'll help me, (laughs) I'll get up and take up my bed and walk. Lord, if you'll help me, I'll leave my water pot and go back home and tell them what great things God has done for me. Lord, if you'll help me, we'll get this ship across the sea. Who else tonight? Just step out of where you are. Let's make you challenge this year a watershed time, a turning point time in your life. Because Jesus showed up. Jesus showed up. He's right here tonight to help you if you'll let him.